Hello and welcome to Digital Creator. Today I am switching up the format a little bit. Also, as you might have noticed, today is Thursday, not the normal Tuesday release date. Uh, like I mentioned, was it yeah, last a couple episodes ago now? Uh, in 2024, I want to experiment with things kind of outside the box as far as formats go for this podcast and really just kind of like find the uh, creative sweet spot for this show. So thank you for bearing with me for one as I experiment with different formats. And uh, today, what I'm going to be talking about are some things that are in the headlines and make it relevant to you and I. And I think this will be kind of, I'm going to have fun recording this. I already know ahead of time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I pulled some headlines of things that are happening around tech and let's talk about them as it's a solo episode and uh, we'll be talking with each other in your ears. <laughs> All right. So also, yeah, I should say that I'm going to experiment with publishing on Thursdays. So my normal recording date for this podcast was typically on Mondays and then I would publish on Tuesdays, but I'm finding that the date would probably be best on Wednesdays and then publish on Thursdays, given the news cycle of things. And just given like kind of midweek recording, I actually got the idea from Marcus Brownlee's podcast waveform. They mentioned they record on Wednesday and I was like, you know what? Actually, I should try that. Uh, I, though I think they release their podcast like some days after, I'm not sure exactly their release date, but for me, I was like, well, if I record on Wednesdays, I don't want to wait all the way until Tuesday. That's almost a full week, especially if I'm going to be talking about anything related to, you know, current events with, it's not all current events here. It's not like some pop culture podcast. I just don't want it to like fizzle out. So much could happen between Wednesday and the following Tuesday. So it made more sense to just publish it on Thursday. Like, why not? Who's saying I can't? Uh, all right, let's hop right in. The first topic up for discussion is the GPT store from OpenAI is now open. The GPT store is going to be like the app store for ChatGPT. And a lot of speculation because it literally just launched earlier today. It's still being rolled out. You might not be able to see it. I'm able to look at some of the things that are available on my phone, but then when I open it up on my computer, I'm like not able to see everything, which is kind of interesting. It just takes me to what the old screen was. Uh, but this is what OpenAI describes GPTs as. It says, discover and create custom versions of ChatGPT that combine instructions, extra knowledge, and any combination of skills and there's these categories up top that you can choose and then it will give you more on. So it has like top it or top picks. Sounds like topics, top picks, Dolly, writing, productivity, research and analysis, programming, education, and lifestyle. So that's the categories. And some of these are from OpenAI, and some of these are made by just you and I people. And if you haven't messed around with GPTs yet, it's basically like creating your own mini chat GPT. You can customize it around like one main idea here. So I'll go down some of the um, featured ones here and kind of read about these and it'll kind of make more sense. So the, in the featured area, which is says curated top picks from this week is the top one is all trails. And with that custom GPT, you can find trails that fit your nature for your next hike, ride, or run. Then there's one from Consensus, which says, formerly research GPT, search 200 million academic papers from Consensus, get science-based answers, and draft content with accurate citations. Then there's Code Tutor, Let's Code Together uh, by Khan Academy. And then there's Books, Your AI Guide in the World of Literature and Reading. Then there's a lot. There's a lot in here. It's kind of like plugins in a way, but uh, more customized. And anyone can make a GPT and then you can get it listed in OpenAI's store. Now, I believe a couple things. You have to be, it has to be approved. So um, OpenAI has to like, you know, approve the GPT going in their store. And then I believe you need a plus account. You need a paid account. I don't think you can have a free account and do this. But I have some thoughts on this. 
uh, because I find them really interesting. And I was just talking about this in the creator club call that we do every Wednesday. And if you're not a part of the creator club, come on, hop right in the creator club.com. So I was just sharing about how I was reading last night about how Poe, uh, a big AI software app saying, and they were just doing a round of fundraising and they were saying, uh, the person who leads Poe, I believe it was, was talking about how, uh, the future of AI and chatbots, and they're really seeing this as a play on creators, like people who create on YouTube specifically, uh, utilizing chatbots, basically like think about, you know, you go to want to ask a creator a question. What if you went to their chatbot and making chatbots really easy to create? Because I don't know about you, but if you've tried over the last couple of years to create a chatbot, it's pretty difficult. There's a lot of steps you have to go through. Um, it used to be really expensive. I was working with someone a couple of years ago, a few years ago now that was like paying thousands and thousands of dollars uh, for someone to take their knowledge and make it into a chatbot, And it was like basic. What we have today with GPTs is incredibly uh, more efficient and better. So I, I don't know. I see things going in the way of GPTs, uh, more chatbot based, more personalized uh, AI tools like this. Uh, and I look at this like a toolbox, right? You have ChatGPT, which is like uh, different tools, but if you, you got to know how to prompt to get what you want out of it. And, you know, there's good prompts and that's going to give you great results. And there's prompts that are going to give you lackluster responses. And with GPTs, it's more personalized and specialized, just like tools, right? Now, I don't see any prices on these GPTs as I'm like going through them. So I don't see any actually for sale, but to my knowledge, they'll be for sale. And then the people who made them can get a cut of it. Um, and I don't know exactly, you know, how much of that cut is. I don't know if they've announced that yet. I'm sure they might have have. I just missed it. But imagine creating your own GPT, putting it up. It's like a knowledge base of things that you've spoke about on your podcast or in your content. People chat with it. They use it. When they use it, you get paid. You know, they pay to access it. Almost like a website. Remember, like you'd go to a website, you'd look through the blogs. GPTs have a lot of potential to be that type of knowledge resource uh, for someone, especially if you're going like just throwing it out there like a Tony Robbins GPT. Now he's like a info based person, right? He's done so many seminars. He's had so many conversations with people. It's so hard to extract the knowledge from someone like him, uh, just through like a blog post. It's almost impossible. But if you use the GPT, you could make things that are specific to you in your life. Imagine being able to go, Tony, I have so much trouble. And say so you were like really respected Tony and what he had to say. Tony, I have so much trouble getting up at 6 a.m. every day. What would you suggest I do? You know, and then there's this detailed response that's almost like Tony giving it to you, but it's personal to the more information you give it. Now, you could try that in ChatGPT right now, but what makes it unique is if Tony has spoken specifically about that topic and it's all trained around, you know, say goals, let's just use a better example, goals for Tony Robbins talking about goals. You have a conversation with it around setting goals. It's going to be way better than trying to get ChatGPT to give you, you know, the output that you're desiring. And so when I look at like the featured ones, especially around uh, the consensus, CoTutor, things like that, uh, it's pretty interesting to see how specialized it is. And again, it's just these tools. So I would recommend playing around with it if you haven't already. I think the paid subscription for ChatGPT and these tools is worth it. At least trying it, you know, for a month just to like wrap your brain around like how these things work, what's going on. Uh, because at the very least you're investing in like your future knowledge of how these things, these things aren't going to go away. Uh, they're only going to progress. I know, you know, I'm at that age where computers were wildly expensive. People 
were slow to adopt them. Some people were. My grandma never adopted them, you know, and she <laughs> lived uh, till last year and she just didn't even adopt to cell phones. Uh, but I think this is one of those things. If you're going to be around, if you plan on being around, it's worth investing some of your time and a little bit of resources in just playing around with it, getting a feel for it. Because if the tool's available for you and you're not even sure if it could save you time, what if it did? And what if it saved you hours? One of the things I do with content clips uh, is just kind of look at how I'm doing things, why I'm doing things, because there's a lot of inefficiencies in what I do. You know, same with this podcast. Like I always release on Tuesday, but what if it was better for me to release it on Thursday and record on Wednesday? That might actually be way better. So, you know, look at those processes, reanalyze what I'm doing. Hmm, where can I be more efficient with my time? Wednesdays are much better days for me to record than Mondays, but I've been doing Mondays for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so well, why not move that around with GPTs? What if there was, you know, there is a GPT actually I've been using that I made that I use in my newsletter. If you read my newsletter, you see that I have uh, an image above like the Dylan's download section. And I use, I, those are like AI images that I've made and I fine tuned them with my own GPT on images that I have liked so what I did was I basically was like, I want to create a illustrator for my newsletter. This is when I was making the GPT. Then I was like, you know, I want it to look like something kind of like out of the New York Times, which is ironic because they're going through that lawsuit with OpenAI right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want it to look like something that might be illustrated in the New York Times. I should be very minimal, not super colorful, just two colors, black and white usually. And no text, just one person. And the dimensions like 9, 1920 by 1080. And it started giving me like, cause I had used that prompt before with using Dolly inside ChatGPT. I would get images, you know, 90% of the images or more. I'm not really happy with, I'm very picky when it comes to the images, but I have like 10, 15 images at this point that I really like that it's given me. So I have those saved on my computer. So when I was making the GPT, for this image illustrator. And I was saying a similar prompt, like I want it to be an illustrator for my newsletter in the style of New York times. These are the dimensions. There was also the ability to upload the files. And these are 15 images that I really like. So make them in this style. Now, when I make now when I use the GPT to create images, whereas before, you know, 90% plus of the images I was not happy with. Now I would say only about 25% of the images I'm not happy with. That means it's got like a, went from like a five to 10% success rate to a 75% plus success rate. And that's huge. And that saves me time on hitting refresh on ChatGPT to create this image that I'm trying to create. And so that's just one of the ways that could be more efficient. And that carves out 25, 30 plus minutes, um, give or take around just the image part, because I put a lot of thought and care into my newsletter and the image is really important to me and I don't put out just anything. So I want it to be related and I want it to look right. Now I'm not obviously making the exact image, not trying it by hand. You don't want me to, because it would not be good, but still I'm trying to get it to look a certain way. I'm like the creative director, I'm the creative prompter, I guess you could say. And uh, thanks to GPTs, I can do that faster. So I look at these tools as just like, yeah, I might not use all of them. I'm not, you know, I might play around with them. Like the consensus one, which you can search 200 million academic papers on from consensus. I've used that before. I could see using that in certain pieces of content that I want to back up with uh, science-based data, you know, look up academic papers and then um, use that. So I could see playing around with these, none of them, you know, right away. I'm like, Oh, I have a need for, but I know they're there and I am comfortable with using them now. So I think like in the future, hmm, if I come across an idea or something I'm working on, like, let me go hop in the GPT GPTs and see if there's something there. Now I know also what I'll be doing is being on the lookout from my 
favorite creators and seeing if they launch any. I don't know off the top of my head who that would be, but like, let's just say Casey Neistat, YouTuber I like. I don't suspect he'd be one to do like GPTs, but what if he did? You know, he's a creative guy. And if he did one and it was interesting, I might like, oh, I'll check it out. If it's paid and it's helpful and it saves me time, like, okay. Uh, as far as the cost goes, I don't know if it's a one-time cost, recurring cost, but it will be interesting to see how it rolls out. And uh, yeah, that's what I'll be on the lookout for GPTs. Topic two I want to talk about, continuing on the theme of AI, and it's not all AI today because I talked about AI last, well, this week, almost said last week, <laughs> uh, just a couple days ago, I was published an episode about AI and using a voice tool. Jeffrey Katzenberg, who is the co-founder of DreamWorks and DreamWorks Animation, which is like one of the biggest movie productions, he's a movie producer, he said, AI will take 90% of artists' jobs on animated films in just three years. Reading that out loud like gives me goosebumps. He says, I don't know of an industry that will be more impacted than any aspect of media, entertainment, and creation. Now, why is this headline interesting coming from Jeffrey Katzenberg, the co-founder of DreamWorks and DreamWorks Animation, who these things are wildly inaccurate, but when I Google or one of the Google things other like searched was like Jeffrey Katzenberg net worth, Google says 900 million, whatever, hundreds of millions of dollars, most likely. I mean, guys, extremely wealthy, three years. That's a, that's a bold statement and a lot of lives are obviously already impacted by AI, but going to be continue to be impacted by AI. It's huge. And I think that even if we're not working on animated films and we're not, you know, artists in that way, I think there's this kind of fear that we all have of like, how are we going to integrate this and, how will our lives continue to be impacted and what can we do to prepare ourselves? And if you've looked at the news headlines lately, the, especially in like the tech space, and I never really paid super close attention to news headlines before I started incorporating, um, relevant stuff in my, uh, newsletter, like tech and creator related things. But I got to like, go through all these layoffs when they come up in the headlines and so many people's jobs are being cut. So many things are happening. Things are just moving at an incredible pace, um, obviously. And we're integrating this like new technology in our lives. Definitely crazy times. And when I see that headline, it just made me pause uh, for someone thinking like just thinking empathetically of like all the people that are going to be affected. But And then I got to the bottom of the article and they buried this kind of like I'm doing, as I say here, Uh, he said, Jeffrey also said individual creativity will still be necessary to prompt the AI prompting is actually going to become a creative commodity. So on one hand, it's like, I read this as, wow, that's incredibly scary. And where will those people go and how will this work? It looks like, you know, things are going to be shifting at a quick pace. And he kind of talks about this because he was speaking at an event in Singapore and, you know, not to just read the whole article, but it was from IndieWire and I'll link to this in the episode description here. But part of the thing he was talking about is like, you look at the last 10 years of tech and then you look at how fast it's moving now, like it's just going to move faster and faster. And we don't have to stay completely up to date with everything to be in the know, right? Like you don't need to know the top of everything now before it was like, Oh, you had to know every musical artist. It's impossible. If you've tried to look at the top 50 artists that are popular right now, everything is so much more personalized than it's ever been before, which is good. And if you're like me, who at one point would buy compilation, now that's what I call music CDs or, you know, you felt like everyone was reading and watching and consuming the same things. It's a weird shift to go to this personalized media uh, consumption 
for creators, it's something because we, you know, want to create something for someone and we're like, oh, I can go really specific these days. And you can be really successful and not have some huge audience. You know, we see people that we've never heard of have millions and millions of subscribers on YouTube. But what we don't see is that there are people doing a lot of money with very, very small followings on social media. Um, and the numbers don't always tell like what's going on. So I say that just because individualism and personalization towards like individuals is going to be just, it's just increasing and increasing. And the skills that we like prepare ourselves with are going to be really important. And I think we used to have to be a little bit more generalist when we would approach things, especially if we wanted to like do things on a bigger scale, but AI is giving us tools that like education wise, we couldn't have got just a couple of years ago, just a year and a half ago. Whereas now you can get answers quicker. Um, but the exact roadmap and personalization is also more difficult. Uh, speaking for creators, for example, like knowing what to fix can be sometimes confusing if you have the manual to everything. You know what I mean? Um, so it's kind of like, I guess as I'm like thinking about this and I'm reading this headline, I'm just thinking it feels like the best way we can equip ourselves is through knowledge, but not being a generalist at everything. It's like knowing how to diagnose the thing that knowing what's needs to be improved and then fixing it and then doing something about it. Um, uh, because there's this like fear, doom and gloom in the headline. And I'm like, that is alarming. And it's not everything like that's just an article. And Jeffrey Katzenberg is this big time movie guy and entertainment and movies. There's a lot of money in it. And we're a part of that as creators. And it's important to know like how things are going to go. But I don't think there's a lot of certainty in what we're doing. And I think that's why it's going to just require us to be quick on our feet, but be like, know how to be knowledgeable about the knowledge that we're given. If that makes sense, like use the tools you have at your disposal, but don't let the tools overwhelm you and know like that you have the tools. That's kind of why I'm saying like GPTs, like play around with them, try these different things out. Like don't, get so stuck in one way of doing something that when something happens or, you know, you got to be quick on your feet, like you're stuck because you're like, I only knew how to do it this one way. The output I'm able to do with content clips, this podcast, the content that I'm doing, I do a lot, but like, I'm not doing so much that I can't function, right? Like, it's not like I'm so busy that I, I've been watching Godzilla movies. Like I, I have never been a fan of Godzilla and I'm just in a Godzilla rabbit hole. And there's so many Godzilla movies. There's like 30 plus, I think. And I started at the beginning. It's a fascinating series, but like, I'm not so busy that I can't, you know, still consume, play a Nintendo here every now and then be with my daughter, you know, be with my wife, learn about these AI things. It's like, because I'm using certain things to my, uh, best of my ability and getting help where I can, uh, but not overwhelming myself in the process. So I guess when I think about like, what can we do to prepare ourselves best for this AI future is like, we can take really good care of ourselves so that we're not bogged down by this pace of technology that we've never experienced before. And if you're in the creator club, uh, I'm sure like you're the, you're a different, you're going at a different pace than most people are because, uh, you're paying attention to things that most people don't pay attention to. Same with, if you're not in the creator club, you're just listening to this podcast. And if you listen this far, you're moving at a pace that most people aren't moving at. I can say that because I speak with so many people and even if it feels like, oh, other people are doing this, there's a comparison of like, we, we were hard on ourselves sometimes. And I think one of the ways we can prepare ourselves for the future is to be more kind on ourselves, more compassion towards what we're doing, 
be easier on ourselves and not feel like we have to do it all, not burn out before we even get to 2025 because it's only <laughs> a couple weeks into 2024. So taking care of yourself is going to be one of the best ways you can prepare yourselves, which has nothing to do with, you know, using every tool at your disposal. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're not even, it's not even going to matter what tool is available. Next topic I wanted to shout about with you today is the wonderful world of sludge content. <laughs> uh, I didn't know this name before this article, but this is fascinating. Scientific American reported on sludge content. And the article is titled Sludge Videos Are Taking Over TikTok and People's Mind. So what is sludge content? I'm going to bring up my window here because it is something that you've all seen. These two sentences or this one sentence explains it best. Sludge content is a type of viral video that features multiple clips playing simultaneously on a screen. These are really popular on TikTok. They have been for a little while. My dad, who consumes a lot of TikTok and a lot of memes, shares these types of videos with me. And sometimes I have a hard time watching them. It feels unhealthy to watch sometimes, but they'll do it a lot on like podcast clips I've noticed. So it'll be a person talking and then you'll see like someone just doing something like could be anything cooking while someone's talking about Elon Musk or someone playing with slime or someone, you know, doing some video game. So there's like two things happening at once. This article is interesting. I recommend checking it out just to familiarize yourself with it. But one thing it highlights that I think is interesting is the myth of multitasking and how we feel like we're doing multiple things at once, but we're really not good at it. Um, and when we go on social media, this is not a, not a professional psychologist, but as someone who has worked with really successful psychologists, uh, just my two cents on, on the idea here is, uh, when we go on social media, it is, and you've probably heard me talk about this before. It's interruption based marketing or content, right? Rarely do you go on TikTok to go for something specific. And even if you do, as soon as you open the app, it's trying to get you to just stay on the app by showing you new and new and new and new things. So when like these sludge videos, which is that type of content, which I know most of my audience does not uh, give into the sludge content. I've messed with a couple of them on my Facebook reels. I haven't published those on Instagram or uh, TikTok, but they did pretty well on Facebook, surprisingly. Um, and I was like, it just didn't feel authentic. I just wanted to test it out. But when you go on these apps, like it's interruption based and there's this constant feeling of newness. How many videos do you see when you open TikTok? Probably a lot. I've tried to look up exactly how many the average person sees in a session. I haven't found any solid numbers on this, but like, let's just say the number was 60 videos in a TikTok session. It's just like new, new, new. The brain wants new. So when you're getting a podcast clip that is interesting, even if the content is interesting, people will still want to scroll because they're seeking new. They're not necessarily seeking the information that's in the clip. Whereas like in a podcast, you get more time to give that information out. But on TikTok, it's a completely different format. That's why on this podcast, it's not, if this was like a, if there was a sludge podcast, it'd be like, ADD podcast and it would be things going at once, right? It, it's not what's happening, but on TikTok, it's a different platform. It's a different format. It's different consumption and people are seeking the new and they're, you know, the dopamine hits. Um, and it's just that con constant novelty factor to it, which is what make is making sludge videos so popular. So, you can look through the article because uh, it talks about media multitasking, it's called, uh, and how it has effects on the developing brain. And it says a 2020 study found that attention and memory recall may worsen in young adults who engage in various digital media on multiple devices simultaneously, such as by watching a show, texting and checking social media at the same time. Sludge content appears to be a supercharged form of media multitasking. 
Then it says like multitasking essentially fragments your attention into tiny nuggets. When your attention jumps between multiple activities or videos on a screen, you're not able to fully comprehend or remember the information in any of the sources. This is because the brain has to switch back and forth to give each one attention. Now, it's easy to say, well, like, just don't consume them, but we have responsibility as creators to be, you know, ethically creating content that we want. And it's not just about maximizing the views, let alone with the sludge content. And it's like, that's not what I want to put out there, but I do want to test it. Uh, like one or two videos just to see what happens. Uh, felt like dirty publishing that on Facebook reels. Um, <laughs> but you know, we have like our ethical considerations when it comes to what we're putting in here and what we're putting out there, because the people that are going on TikTok, like my dad, for example, he's on, he's 73, 74, 74. He's not, he has no idea on like creating a TikTok video. Younger people have no idea when it comes to creating a TikTok video, um, like us as creators. And, you know, we think about what we're putting out there is affecting someone. We don't always see the effects of it, but we can create content that is not making people uh, have worse comprehension. You know what I mean? And like I say that, you know, I've experimented with that sludge. Con Again, it was literally like one or two videos. Uh, and like the, on the flip side of that, I've also experimented with slower content, with not as stimulating content, and it is not all that different. Like, I will st still consume content as long as the topic is interesting, uh, and I have editors edit my videos, and I don't give them a lot of direction. Uh, oftentimes, I'll give my own videos as a way to, like, test editors to see their style, to see what they can do with no direction. And then I'll post those videos. But I think as creators, like one of the things we can do is interrupt how people are consuming content, give enriching topics. Doesn't mean that has to be like super one way or the other, like enriching could simply be sometimes just inspiring people to think about a topic differently or educate them on some simple idea. Uh, but one thing, you know, we just simply help make someone's day brighter, like without overstimulating them. And that's totally okay too, because if you had more time to edit your videos and if you hired like the best editors, you know, they might make stuff they they're going to maximize views and your goal really as a creator should be to maximize like your message. I think a thought like, I don't know. I just kind of thinking like one of the things we can do is keep that message of the priority and not edit the video in such a way that it destroys it and becomes like sludge content where <laughs> you're hooking people for the wrong reasons, like an unethical hook. To me, sludge content is like, it's put it in like someone around more my age, which I'm 34, turning 35 this year. To me, sludge content is kind of similar to like the bait and switch kind of content. It's like, there's no nutrition to it. You promise one thing and you give nothing and you get a view in return. Like that's how I see the sludge content. People are maybe watching it for the thing that's in there that's not about the video. And also that makes the testing part hard. Like if a client came to Content Clips and they were like, this is our style of what we do. I would be like, this is not the style we do. I've never worked with a client that has done that style of content. I wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to work with them in that capacity. But you don't know which part they're watching. And I would not suspect that those people would convert better. And for the people that are just like maximizing views, that's why I don't think it's the best thing for creators is just more views. Uh, similar to how I was just saying previously about, I think personalization and uh, us as individuals, we want more personalized content 
similar for the content that we're creating is like, if your style does not match up with sludge content, no nutritional value, like the hooks that are over promising the world and then just don't deliver. You don't have to do that. Like 200 views is fine. If that, if those 200 views are like the right 200 views, than getting 200,000 views or 2 million views. So all that to say, I think it's pretty clear that I'm not one of those uh, creators who just all I care about is views. Absolutely not. I would rather have two views at the end of the day if it meant uh, I really believed in what I was saying versus uh, just trying to maximize everyone's attention because you can get attention. What do you do with the attention? You know, I'm not Mr. Beast. I have no desire to be Mr. Beast. Um, and so I think it's just the ethical considerations we have as creators. Something to think about worth checking out that article. Thanks for sticking with me through this new format. I had fun talking about this stuff. It's fun exploring ideas that I hadn't really explored previously and kind of going through things that are happening and then like placing them with uh, as, us as creators and kind of in this, like the business space, solopreneur, entrepreneur space. It's a new angle on a similar topic with new topics because of the news. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, I'm going to keep it going on Wednesdays, release Thursdays. Be curious. Let me know what you think. Uh, any feedback is helpful feedback. I'll see you in the next one.